Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Saltzbaugh, and I'm the Program Manager for the Reef Foundation's Peer and Family Support Program. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Wheelchair Barbie Goes to the Gynecologist. Thank you all so much for joining us and for taking time out of your day to do so. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take just a moment to introduce you to our presenter, Cody Unser. Cody is a leading advocate for people living with disabilities, passionate about the health care of women with disabilities, including their reproductive and sexual health. Cody has delivered presentations on the issues they face at the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology's National Conference and also at OBGYN Grand Rounds at medical facilities and universities across the country. Cody also writes as a patient advocate for US News and World Report about everything she experiences relating to having a disability and navigating the world. Cody also holds a master's degree in public health from George Washington University in Washington, DC. In addition, following her diagnosis of transverse myelitis at the age of 12, Cody, along with her mother, Shelley, founded the Cody Unser First Step Foundation. The foundation raises awareness, encourage, encourages medical collaboration, and works to improve the quality of life of individuals living with paralysis, or excuse me, with transverse myelitis, and that of their families as well. Before we begin, I would like to note that some of the webinar's content will touch on sensitive issues like sex and sexuality in the disability community and there are a few images depicting those themes. However, this is meant to be an open, honest, and educational conversation. I would like to thank Cody so very much for being our presenter today, especially on such an important topic. With that, I will now turn the webinar over to her. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, what's up, everybody? Um, even though I can't see you, I know you're all there. So I'm very excited to be presenting this topic. Um, it's a huge passion of mine. I've not only experienced uh, the inadequacies around uh, this topic in different clinics around the country, but I've also sort of researched it, studied it, and I've written about it, and I've been presenting it around the country. So I'm super excited to be here. And I would like to begin with kind of why I titled the presentation this way, Wheelchair Barbie Goes to the Gynecologist. Uh, so we all know the iconic uh, Barbie doll that came out in the 1960s. And actually, Mattel, the company, um, they sort of, over the years, have become more sort of inclusive for other girls, you know, with different backgrounds and different ethnicities. And so in 1997, they actually launched Wheelchair Barbie, and her name is Becky. And so they launched her, and unbeknownst to them, um, she couldn't actually get into Barbie World's house, like the front door. So a bunch of comparents called and complained and said, you know, my daughter, you know, is trying to play with wheelchair Barbie, but she can't actually fit into the house. So then the company went back to the drawing board um, and they actually had to cut her hair a little bit because her hair was like rolling in her wheels. They made the wheelchair smaller and they relaunched her. And so now she was able to actually get into uh, Barbie's house. Then the second problem arose um, because it was a second level house and actually there's an elevator, it was like a tube elevator that went up to the second floor. And now wheelchair Barbie can't actually get into the elevator. So again, the company Mattel received a bunch of complaints from parents um, and they, pretty much the company decided to discontinue her. So you can only buy her on eBay or Craigslist. And I think like for a lot of women with disabilities or paralysis, like we feel this way. We feel kind of discontinued. We're an afterthought. We don't matter. It's too much of a hassle for society to sort of help us figure this out. Uh, so that's kind of why I titled this presentation this way is because we kind of relate to Wheelchair Barbie. Um, I'm, I am really excited to say that uh, Mattel actually has relaunched her, uh, I believe, this year, so we can actually buy her again. So that's why I titled this presentation this way. So here's my disclosure uh, sort of slide. Uh, like the neon sign says, nope, I have nothing to disclose. So again, I want to thank everybody that's on this call. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all. 
And I want to thank Rebecca uh, for being here and for inviting me to present to all of you. I want to thank uh, ACOG and ABOG, which are kind of the leading agencies around um, obstetrics and gynecology. And I want to thank my family and friends for being here um, and supporting me. And, you know, the whole entire Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation team, um, they've been so awesome to work with. And I just want to say, like, for all, whoever's on the call, if you're a woman with a disability or if you're a caregiver or a loved one of somebody with a disability um, or even a physician on this call, um, I hope this presentation, you, you can take something away from it. Um, I've worked really hard on it, and it's, you know, it's very personal to me. So I hope something, you get something out of it. So just to tell you a little bit about my story and myself, um, I grew up here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, actually in a racing family. So I grew up in auto racing. Uh, my family's won the Indianapolis 500 nine times. Um, so growing up, we were always, us kids were always on like an engine or a motor. So four wheelers, jet skis, snowmobiles. So I grew up as a very active child and then Pretty much um, on February 5th, 1999, my world completely changed forever. And I think a lot of people uh, with disabilities uh, can relate to their own unique story. But I woke up like any other day, got dressed for school. Um, I was 12 years old in sixth grade, went to school, and then I went to basketball practice afterwards where I suddenly had a hard time catching my breath, like I couldn't breathe. So I set out and my symptoms got worse. So I got this massive headache that I've never felt in my entire life, and the school I was ten attending called 911. They took me to the locker room, and I laid down, and that's when my left leg went completely numb, and my right leg was kind of tingling. So in a matter of 20 minutes, my entire world changed. Um, I became paralyzed instantly. So I went to the hospital, um, and I remember being, you know, in this large wheelchair, and my legs were dangling, and the emergency room was very chaotic, and the doctors kept trying to do a bunch of tests. They asked me if I, if I could go to the bathroom, and I said, oh, I'll try, but I don't have, I don't have the feeling. So um, basically, they had no idea what was going on, no idea what was wrong, so they sent me home. Um, I was paralyzed. I couldn't urinate. But they said drink lots of fluids. Uh, so went home hoping that all of this was going to go away and I was going to play basketball the next day. So I woke up the next day and my belly was like extended because they said drink lots of fluids, but I couldn't pee. Uh, so my primary care came to the house and she said, Cody, let's put you in the bathtub to see if like the water will help you go to the bathroom. And so that's when I completely broke down crying um, because I couldn't feel the texture or the temperature of the water. Um, so I like knew, oh my gosh, something's really wrong. So I went back to the hospital um, and in a matter of like a week or so, they kind of just gave me my fate of transverse myelitis. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if I, were, if I was going to be able to walk again, um, I just was, you know, now paralyzed and very scared, very frustrated. Uh, and so after a few months in the hospital, I went to rehab. Like most of us who, who are newly injured or paralyzed, we go to rehab to learn how to live in a wheelchair. And no one told me that. I thought, oh, they're going to teach me how to walk again. Uh, but in reality, it was anything but that. It was everything was around the box I was now living in. Um, I hated my wheelchair. I hated my body. I hated this new existence. Uh, they taught me how to wheel through grass, how to dress myself, bathe myself. Um, I just felt very vulnerable, very, um, you know, kind of just defeated. And I kind of thought, okay, half of a body meant half of an existence. I was only going to experience things in half. Uh, so I was very kind of angry and frustrated and sad. Um, I called my therapist Godzilla because <laughs> you could hear her coming a mile away. Um, so I was like in rehab for about three months and then I came back home and uh, pretty much, I mean, I was still very very angry, very sad and frustrated, um, but I wanted to do something about this. I wanted, there's gotta be a meaning to what just happened to me. 
So my mom and I created the Cody Unser First Step Foundation, and it gave me a purpose and a meaning and a drive to do something to help other people. So it's pretty much the foundation's got three pillars. We start with awareness um, because transverse myelitis is a rare disorder. It's kind of related to MS, but it gets misdiagnosed all the time. And so we wanted doctors and teaching hospitals to start sharing data, and I wanted to talk to people and families who, you know, get newly diagnosed with transverse myelitis. So it was all about awareness. Um, and then as kind of time went by, um, my older brother Al um, was kind of an older brother uh, kind of teaching me how to do wheelies in the chair. He wanted me to look cool in the chair. Um, he said, Cody, you're going to learn how to scuba dive. So he basically kind of just threw me in the pool and said, you're going to do this. I don't care how frustrated you get. You're going to do this. So I learned how to, how to scuba dive, got trained, um, and it's really hard because the wetsuit is such a pain in the butt to get on for anybody, but for people with disabilities or limited mobility, it's even more challenging. So learning about the gear, learning how to breathe underwater, suddenly my world changed because um, everything that I had experienced up until that point was all about the chair, the frustration about getting around in the world and uh, so this was like a new challenge. So it was nothing to do with my chair, nothing to do with my paralysis. So I said, I said to my mom, you know, we need to create a quality of life program for other people with disabilities because this was my aha moment. I felt like I can do anything in the world, and I want to go to school. I want to do this. I want to do that. So we basically started a quality of life program and have been going around the country providing uh, this experience for other people with disabilities. So um, that's the other pillar. And then I also am kind of an advocate to kind of what Rebecca was saying. Um, I am a huge advocate for, you know, stem cell research and um, anything new and inventive um, to help us people with disabilities, you know, kind of engage back into the world. So um, I'm just really, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm going to continue to do it. Um, but I think the biggest message I can give to anybody that's hearing me is, Find your passion, find a purpose, um, because it really has helped me sort of uh, deal with being paralyzed. So um, that's kind of my story, and we'll move on to the next slide. So what is a disability? Um, so usually when I give this presentation, it's to residents, you know, people in the healthcare profession. So I kind of go through this sort of background about disability. So there's two competing sort of theories or definitions um, that have sort of shaped how we think about disability. So the first one is from the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and they sort of define disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So then they actually go and list what those major life activities are. So caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking. Um, you guys can read the list. Um, and then um, the World Health Organization actually defines disability in more of a holistic kind of point of view. So they describe disability as health is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So these are the sort of two definitions that have shaped disability. And then there's that big system uh, statistic there on the right um, that 56.7 million of Americans live with a disability. This number is not going to change. It's not going to go down. It's only going to go up. So this is a population that we really need to um, sort of consider and think about um, because there's so many of us that are dealing with different um, sort of factors and secondary conditions. So kind of diving a little further into more of a philosophical conversation about disability, um, these are sort of the two competing theories that have also shaped the disability sort of um, community. So we have the medical model versus the social model. So the medical model really focuses on the individual with a disability. So we got to fix that person, we got to cure that person. Um, it is about the whole traditional thought that uh, this person needs to be sort of fixed. And so it really focuses on the disability is first and foremost a medical state, emphasizing the physical, intellectual, sensory, 
neurological or psychological difference. So again, the emphasis is on the individual functional limitation. Then there's the social model around disability uh, that sort of describes disability as an experience, basically created by social responses to uh, beliefs regarding and accommodations for people with impairments. So here it's about sort of uh, the emphasis is societal norms, beliefs, practices, adaptability, interaction with the environment. So kind of to give you an example, we'll go back to sort of wheelchair Barbie. So Mattel, they took the medical model and said, oh, well, we need to fix her. We need to fix the chair. Um, whereas the social model, what they should have done is actually fix the house. She's fine completely the way she is. Uh, let, let's fix her surroundings and her environment. So kind of like the picture that I have here on the right side um, of the wheelchair and the stairs, again, the medical model says, oh, well, we got to fix the person in the wheelchair so they can actually go up the stairs. Uh, whereas the social model says, no, let's put an elevator or, you know, a ramp. Um, not, we don't have to fix that person in the chair. So these are the two competing theories that have sort of um, uh, shaped the disability community. So just to give you guys a, a little overview or snapshot of women with disabilities in the US, there are 27 million women who are living with some form of a disability. And sort of the major forms that we, the more common forms that we see are arthritis, neuromuscular disorders, multiple sclerosis, stroke, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries. So compared to women in general, women with physical disabilities, we are so like, more likely to be single, have less than a high school education, uh, be unemployed, live in poverty, and have inadequate access to health care. So when I started doing my research around this topic because I was experiencing so many inadequacies and uh, a lot of gaps in this, in this sort of environment, um, I ran into a bunch of studies that really consistently show that women with disabilities have poorer health compared to women without disabilities. And this is actually especially when it comes to their sexual and reproductive health. So um, the big takeaway that I would love everybody to sort of um, take away from this sort of presentation is that we matter. Women with disabilities and their sexual and reproductive health matters. Um, we shouldn't, we should be loud about it. We shouldn't hide behind it. Um, so I always sort of scream that, you know, this is a topic that really matters. So health starts from the context of which we live. So if you look to the right where I have sort of the pink circles, um, and they're all sort of touching each other, we'll begin with self-awareness. So it's really about us women with disabilities really empowering ourselves to take care of ourselves. Um, what we eat, how much we work out, um, you know, do how much we play, how much we, you know, work. Uh, so it's all really about your self-awareness and kind of your own, um, you know, what condition you have, what disability you have or paralysis. So it's all about you. So then it kind of goes into our relationships. So our families, our friends, um, our intimate loved ones, um, and how we interact with people. And then kind of the environment sort of um, shapes that whole thing as well. So how we engage with society um, and accessibility comes with that too. So the health uh, starts from the context of which we live. And then kind of diving a little further into that um, is our pelvic health. And that includes our bladder, our bowel, our organs of reproduction, which then include our ovaries, uterus, cervix, vagina, and external genitalia. And these all really, too, affect our overall physical, mental, social, and sexual well-being. Um, I don't know if any women on the call right now can relate to me, but um, I've had, I can't tell you how many times I've had a bladder or bowel accident during sex, and it's completely embarrassing. You don't know what to do. You're freaking out, um, and it really affects you. Like, you feel super embarrassed. Um, I usually tell the guy, hurry up, get in the shower, or I'll figure out what, what I need to do here, but it really, all these things really do affect our quality of life. Um, and it's, you know, we need to talk about it more, especially to our providers. So, um, which leads me to sort of talk about secondary conditions. And so, 
Um, one of the things that I have found to be kind of a, a tip or what's helpful is every provider that I talk to, I always sort of in, uh, talk to them about my secondary conditions because we're not just sitting in our wheelchair, right? So we deal with so many other issues that you can't really see. So secondary conditions are medical, physical, cognitive, emotional, or psychosocial complications of a primary disabling condition. And these really do impact our daily activities and quality of life. So sort of the list is anxiety, arthritis, autonomic dysreflexia, which is in red for a reason. I'll get to that in a second. Blood pressure problems, <laughs> bowel and bladder dysfunction, circulatory problems, dehydration, depression is a really big problem, um, diabetes, dietary specifications, fatigue, heart disease, menstrual problems, um, osteoporosis. Uh, I'm 32 years old and I have osteoporosis from not standing and bearing weight. So my bones are really fragile. Um, and I actually broke my left femur um, right before going off to college. And I didn't realize how bad my sort of osteoporosis was at that point. So this is something that we really need to sort of think about as well. Uh, overweight and obesity, um, I think a lot of people on the call can relate to. It's really hard to manage that and find a gym that's accessible or a trainer that will work with you. So managing our weight is a big deal. Uh, pain, nerve pain really does affect our daily life. Range of motion, regulating body temperature, respiratory issues, sexual dysfunction, skin breakdown. Um, I have a, a, a very sensitive spot on my tailbone because I'm sitting all the time. And that's something that I'm constantly watching is to make sure that that doesn't get worse and it doesn't end, you know, I don't end up in the hospital with that. So that's something that's a, another issue. Um, sleep disorders, spasticity, substance abuse, you know, for, you know, kind of the depression um, or, or our mental health. A lot of people, you know, kind of drink or get into substance abuse problems um, and then weakness as well. So these are secondary conditions that you really should voice to your any health provider you talk to um, because it's going to help you in the long run. So I highlighted autonomic dysreflexia in red for a reason, uh, because a lot of health care professionals really don't know what it is, and a lot of people really don't know what it is. Um, I tell my friends all the time, I mean, my family knows it, but basically it's a potentially life-threatening medical emergency that affects people with spinal cord injuries at the T6 level or higher. So although rare, some people with T7 and T8 injuries can develop it, but for most, and for most people, AD can be easily treated as well as prevented. It really is about knowing your baseline blood pressure triggers and symptoms. So kind of like uh, the guy in the uh, wheelchair to the right, um, he's sitting on a ticking time bomb. It's kind of like that. Um, and when triggered, AD requires a quick and correct action or there may be serious consequences such as a stroke. So again, because many healthcare professionals are not familiar with this condition, it is really important for all of us who are at risk for AD to um, you know, talk about it and recognize our symptoms and know how to act. So what are some causes of autonomic dysreflexia? Um, Autonomic dysreflexia is caused by an irritant below the level of injury. So wherever you're paralyzed at, um, anything that happens below that level, your, base, your body basically triggers a response. So my, when my bladder gets full, I'll get goosebumps or I'll get like flushed in the face. So it's my body telling me, okay, Cody, something's wrong. You've got to fix this. Um, so again, so kind of the bladder irritation of the bladder wall, um, when I get a UTI infection, um, so we all have to sort of pay attention to our body really hardcore. Um, a blocked catheter or, or overfilled collection bag can cause it. Um, even our bowel disorders, so constipation um, uh, uh, or an impaction. Um, other causes include skin infections or irritations, cuts, bruises. Um, ingrown toenails, um, uh, kind of like my pressure sore, you know, if it gets, when it gets worse, it kind of triggers AD. So I kind of have to figure out what's going on. Um, and actually, AD can also be triggered by sexual activity. So I usually get really flushed in the face, um, and I know that it's kind of a temporary activity, so I don't have to, you know, sort of fix the problem. But 
um, I'm just aware of it. Uh, menstrual cramps, um, even though I can't feel uh, when I'm on my period, I def- my body does. So I, you know, again, get goosebumps or headaches. Um, and then also during labor and delivery, a lot of women with disabilities or paralysis that have AD, um, it can be triggered by labor and delivery. Um, over ovarian cysts, bone fractures. Um, and then also the one thing that I always say is that a cold speculum can actually cause AD. So during an annual exam, um, every time that I go in, I always kind of tell, you know, the provider that I, you know, can get AD. And so please warm up the speculum. Um, I don't know what woman wants, what any woman wants a cold speculum, but I think for a lot of us women with disabilities who have AD, this is a really serious um, sort of matter. So I always, a tip that I always do is sort of, um, before the exam even starts, I have them take my blood pressure before and then after the exam is done um, to see if there's any, dis, you know, uh, difference. Um, so that's something that we always have to pay attention to. So kind of talking about society um, and women with disabilities. So women with disabilities are either viewed as broken vessels, we're fragile, we're unworthy, or we're also on the other spectrum, we're listed as a fetish or on someone's bucket list of sexual conquest. Like, have you done the crippled chick lately? And a lot of this is um, uh, sort of shaped by the sort of his- history that women with disabilities have had. So a lot of people with disabilities, we were put in institutions, there's a uh, historical oppression. Um, and then as kind of time went on and as the disability movement got ground and really started changing things, we became more of like a social isolation um, group. And then kind of over time again, um, now we're considered a minority group. And the thing that I always say is that, you know, you can join, it's the largest minority group that anybody can join at any time because anything can happen to anybody at any time. Um, So now we're kind of considered a minority group, um, which has kind of led us to really talk about hot topics like sexuality and reproduction. Um, but this is kind of, you know, we're, we're either viewed as broken vessels or a sexual conquest. And this has got to change. I mean, we're, you know, sort of independent women that, you know, sort of want to engage back into life. And, but there is sort of a historical context, context that has sort of shaped how we um, have been viewed. So talking about sexuality and the disabled body a little further, um, I love history because it really sort of has defined uh, sort of our group and our community. Um, uh, The eugenics movement, so this guy named Francis Galton, he was an archeologist, an explorer. He really loved sort of Charles Darwin. Um, And so during the 1800s, he kind of created this eugenics movement where everything was about selective breeding of preferred traits. We're basically building um, an improved human race where people with disabilities should not breed. We are a burden on society. We shouldn't um, be out in public. Um, We are a burden on the healthcare system because we require so much. And actually between the 1930s and 1970s, 28 states, adopted sterilization laws and over 200,000 women were sterilized. So this is like a huge sort of issue and a lot of women with disabilities who go into an OBGYN um, sort of office have been told um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have kids. Uh, you, you can barely take care of yourself. You shouldn't have kids. Um, so we're always talked out of it um, and we want to have a family. We want to be like everybody else. We want to, you know, engage back into society. So actually in 1881, um, Chicago adopted this sort of city code called the Ugly Laws, where any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way deformed shall not expose themselves to public view. So people with disabilities were actually um, fined or put into jail based on this whole ugly law concept. So I think for a lot of us women with disabilities, you know, um, the whole concept about who is beautiful and who is not. Um, how can we be sexy like everybody else? Um, I remember kind of growing up being a teenager in a wheelchair. I was watching my friends sort of, you know, get in tight jeans and shake their asses to Bruno Mars. Um, 
but I wasn't able to do that because I'm sitting on my butt. So how can I be sexy too? How can I be like them? Uh, so kind of the whole concept about who's beautiful, who's not, has been sort of shaped by um, sort of this eugenics movement and history around um, kind of, again, who is beautiful and who is not. So then we actually um, get to talk about disability and Playboy and sex surrogate. So this woman named Ellen Stahl, um, she became paralyzed in a car accident. And she was really trying so hard to fight for her sexuality. Again, because, you know, a lot of us women, we have atrophied legs. You know, we're not considered sexy. We have, I have a pair of gut, you know. Um, so she really fought for her sexuality. And she wrote a letter to uh, Hugh Hefner. Um, to really challenge this whole concept of, you know, um, again, who is sexy and who is not, because society has really shaped it. Um, we see it in the fashion industry. Um, we're told what to wear, what makeup to use. So I really love this quote by her. She said, I realized I was still a woman, but the world didn't accept me as that. Sexuality is the hardest thing for a disabled person to hold on to. And I don't know if other women on the phone um, on this call can relate to me, but it's my experience has really been about accepting and rejecting myself at the same time. So I would love to walk again. I would love to, you know, fill the sand um, on my feet. Uh, so in that sense, I'm, I've been rejecting my body, kind of. Um, I want to be beautiful like everybody else. Um, but also at the same time, I've accepted who I am. I totally embraced it. Um, I found my own uniqueness into this experience. So, uh, you know, this is my journey. So it's been about sort of accepting and rejecting myself too. So it's a dichotomy that a lot of people with disabilities experience. Um, and then actually, uh, there are sex surrogates out there. Um, the movie, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's called The, Ses uh, the Sessions. And it really tells the story of a man confined to an iron lung living with polio. And he is so determined to lose his virginity, and he actually seeks out a sex therapist. So there are these um, sort of professionals out there, because we all want to be loved. We all want to be intimate with somebody, but it's really challenging for, you know, people with disabilities to really sort of engage in that. And so this whole idea about sex surrogates has been really kind of interesting um, to sort of find and um, sort of watch. So talking a little further um, about sexuality for women with disabilities. So women with disabilities, actually, we can lead loving, intimate, and fulfilling sex lives. But we are so often seen as asexual, even in the healthcare profession. Um, and just because there's a lack of function and or sensation, um, it just means we have to, you know, get a little more creative, a little more innovative, and have a connection and an intimacy with somebody. So kind of, um, you don't want to get too creative um, because I, I mean, the thing that, that I pay attention to is because I have osteoporosis, I don't want to break a bone during sex. Um, so there is a limit to what you, you know, have to do, but we can lead loving, fulfilling sex lives. Um, there is sort of this whole idea about a phantom orgasm, actually, because a lot of people sort of uh, think that the sexual response is just in certain areas of the body. When in fact, um, just even touching somebody's, you know, ear or connecting with somebody in a different way that they don't really think about um, could actually happen. So um, to talk about a little more of the common sexual dysfunctions for women um, with disabilities. So a lot of us, like we have an inability to achieve orgasm. We have pain during sex, um, lack of interest in sex, trouble with lubrication. Um, I don't know about anybody on the phone, but I take medication for my bladder, which makes my mouth really dry, makes everything else really dry. So trouble with lubrication, I think, is a big deal. Um, lack of pleasurable sex. So kind of talking about this to healthcare professionals is a really big issue. Um, I remember one of my exams at an OBGYN office, uh, the nurse, I was waiting in the room for the doctor, and the nurse had just left, and she left kind of the door open, and I overheard her actually tell the doctor, oh, by the way, she is sexually active. So this is a really big sort of assumption that we don't have sexual lives, and I'm trying to change that, and I think a lot of us, you know, we should really empower ourselves to, to really scream it and really be loud about it.
So um, diving in a little further, more specific about the sexual response. Um, so on the left, here's the traditional model um, of the sexual response. So the, we start with desire, uh, desire, arousal, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. So for a lot of women, able-bodied women, this is kind of their experience. But the sexual response of women with disabilities is just a little different. Um, I kind of compare it to a Jackson Pollock painting, right? So we are dealing with bladder accidents. Am I going to pee on the guy? Um, am I going to have a bowel accident and my, you know, bone fractures? Like I'm worried about my bones breaking, um, pain, anxiety. We have anxiety over all these issues, um, spasticity. Um, it takes forever for my legs to actually like sort of calm down, uh, lubrication. So kind of there is a, a, a very big difference between you know, women with disabilities and women without disabilities. And so I always sort of talk about it um, as the sexual response. So talking about pregnancy and women with disabilities, um, again, we want to have families. We want to lead um, a loving life with an intimate partner. We want to have kids. But again, historical context does matter. So we have the reproductive rights movement, right? So a lot of women we're fighting for the right to have an abortion. Whereas the disability rights movement, a lot of us women were actually fighting for the right not to have an abortion. So really talking to our providers and healthcare professionals about, you know, I wanna, ha I wanna start a family. Um, we shouldn't be a burden on society. That doesn't, you know, it shouldn't matter. Um, so women with disabilities can have successful pregnancies, um, but it's often seen or considered as high risk. So you really want to involve a comprehensive healthcare team where your OBGYN talks to your neurologist or whatever sort of paralyzed you. Um, you want to have a team that really sort of takes everything at different angles. So again, autonomic dysreflexia can intensify. So a lot of the stories that I read for about women who have had successful, you know, pregnancies, they said they had a really hard hard time distinguishing between their bladder kind of moving or you know kind of getting full. And then sort of is the baby moving. So it's kind of, we have a unique experience for sure. Um, but autonomic dysreflexia can intensify during labor and delivery. So again, you want to have a, a comprehensive healthcare team for sure. So what are the barriers to quality of care? Um, so over um, sort of my journey, I've never had a good OBGYN experience. I've been to different clinics across the country, and I found this trend, really. And uh, to talk a little bit about the first sort of barrier, um, they are structural in nature. So these are heavy doors, um, inaccessible bathrooms. We can actually get into the clinic. Um, and then the big one that I've noticed is the exam room table. So it's always super high. I can't transfer onto it. Uh, it's narrow. I can easily spasm right off of it um, because my, when I move my body, um, my legs sort of spasm. So this is a big deal. And we want to be able to take care of ourselves and actually transfer ourselves onto the table. And so for the longest time, I would always have to bring my mom or a friend into my exam because of this. And it really sucks. Um, but there are tables out there for clinics to actually get, which we need to really, all of us women, really need to encourage and fight for because it really does affect you. I mean, it's a dignity thing too. You wanna be able to take care of yourself and transfer, transfer onto the table. So I've ran into this problem constantly and it's something that we definitely need to change. And then this sort of second barrier that I've noticed um, are the attitudinal barriers. So these are behaviors or perceptions that really prevent people from communicating. So it's a lack of understanding, a sensitivity, knowledge of providers that really can lead to incorrect assumptions and discriminatory statements. So really it's all about, I mean, the, the fact that a lot of the physicians and providers and the OBGYN doctors, they've never taken really a course on disability. There is no course um, in college or med school. So they don't know anything around disability issues unless we women actually say what, what's going on. So they do have a lack of understanding, um, a lack of sensitivity. So we really need to encourage the provider to learn about you know, your condition. 
Um, I always bring in a pamphlet or talk about transverse myelitis. I always like say what secondary conditions I have. So it's really about, uh, we have to be teachers basically to the doctors. Um, so be very specific on your medical history. That's really big. Um, and this includes sort of your management medication. So what do you do on your, what's your daily routine? Um, your, your bladder and bowel routine, do you cast? Um, what is it that you kind of deal with? And definitely your sexual history. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed to say that you're sexually active because the doctors have the assumption that you're not. Um, and that really needs to change for, for sure. So the more, this is kind of my big tip, um, the more you say, the more you receive. So the more specific and detailed you can be to the provider, the more that they can understand and give you, you know, the knowledge that they have. And you basically create this dialogue and communication. Um, I'm a very open person, so that's kind of, you know, the more open and honest you can be, the more you'll get back from the doctor. And, you know, one size does not fit all. So we're not all the same. You know, I have transverse myelitis, uh, but somebody with multiple sclerosis or, you know, they got uh, paralyzed in a car accident. So we all have our own issues. We are not just one sort of group. So the more specific, again, that you can be to your provider, the better your sort of health outcomes are going to be in the long run. So um, basically uh, what I've noticed about the physical and these attitudinal barriers is that there are consequences to them. So women with disabilities are more likely to experience diagnosis delays of sexually transmitted diseases, breast cancer, or cervical cancer. Women with disabilities are less likely to have preventative screen tests, including mammography, pap smear, and HIV testing. Women with disabilities who feel sort of defeated or rejected by an OBGYN will not care for their bodies. They will engage in risky behaviors such as multiple sex partners, sexual abuse, and violence. So kind of the story that I share with this slide is that um, I was going to school in D.C. Um, and I had just broken up with the love of my life, my boyfriend, felt really sort of um, just depressed and sad. And I started just having sex with a bunch of people. Um, I started drinking too much. I just didn't care. I just didn't care about myself anymore. And so um, it was one day I woke up and I was like, Cody, you know, you're better than this. You need to take care of yourself. Um, you, you matter to people. You can help people. So I actually made an OBGYN appointment um, in D.C. And I went. And uh, lo and behold, the nurse had to sort of pick me up and put me on the table because it was too high. And then the, uh, the OBGYN provider came into the room and I said, you know, I have transverse myelitis, I'm paralyzed from the chest line down, I deal with spasms. So the best way for you to do this exam is for me to scoop my butt all the way to the edge. Um, I'll just hold my legs. I don't want, you know, I can't put my legs in the stirrups. They're not going to stay there. So I go through this whole explanation, um, and as he sort of began the exam, my legs started spasming, and he reached over and kind of patted me on the head and said, oh, no, don't be nervous. And I was just like, wait, did you just not hear what I just, I mean, my, I have spasms. I'm paralyzed. This happens. So I, I felt real, really rejected and kind of defeated because he didn't hear me. He didn't listen. I just felt okay, if he doesn't care about my body, why should I? So maybe I should just be having a bunch of sex with people. Um, so that's, I mean, these, these barriers do have consequences, and it's something that we definitely need to change. So there is sort of a policy or a law um, that's been enacted. We're all sort of a, a aware of the ADA. But it does prohibit discrimination and ensures equal opportunity for persons with disabilities in employment, state and local government services, public accommodations, commercial facilities, and transportation. So, in, and actually, um, uh, Title III of the ADA really sort of encourages private hospitals and medical offices to be covered um, so that it's accessible. The problem with the ADA, and I totally think it needs to be revamped, uh, remodeled, is um, there is no ADA police, right? So there is no enforcement. There's not like a group of people going around to make sure 
that, you know, every building is accessible, every healthcare office is accessible. So it's really the burden on us with disabilities to write a complaint. Um, we're the, you know, the bad guys basically to say that, you know, your building's not accessible. Um, so this is, you know, it does need to be revamped, but this is something that, you know, has protected people with disabilities. So I want to share um, some tips with you guys that I've, that I've sort of uh, learned. Um, and uh, I want to start with the physical sort of accessibility ones. So before you go to an OBGYN clinic, definitely call. Like when you make the appointment, um, call and ask these questions. Is the parking lot accessible? You will be surprised that some of them aren't. Um, when I was in DC, there was no accessible parking. So I really had a hard time navigating that. That was my first barrier. Um, can I actually get into and around the clinic? Um, I remember going to a clinic in DC and there was a set of stairs down to the front door. So I had to, cancel, I had to leave and cancel that appointment. So I was like, okay, I need to call and ask these questions ahead of time. Uh, is the bathroom accessible? You really want the bathroom to be accessible, and some of them really aren't. They're too narrow, or they don't have a handlebar for you to help you transfer. So that's a question to ask. Um, is the exam room table accessible for me? Again, I have this in red because a lot of them aren't. Um, does it raise up and down? You kind of have to be specific to the person you're talking to. Um, you know, say that you're paralyzed or you're disabled in some way, the more knowledge you give them, the better your experience is going to be. So, um, and if they don't have uh, an, an uh, elevated exam table, ask them about the procedure room. Um, that's one thing that I've noticed. They, they do actually have, some clinics have a procedure room um, for different things that they have to do, um, and that exam table is usually always accessible. So, Definitely keep that sort of um, in mind. And kind of going into further with different tips, um, I want to talk about the patient-provider communication. This is a really big one. So at each step, provide the healthcare team your complete medical history and needs. So it really begins with the first phone call, like I just said. You really want to ask, or you really want to ask questions about their accessibility in the office. Um, to that person and definitely tell them, you know, you are paralyzed, um, you want to come in for an, an annual exam. And then actually once you get there, say, tell the person or the administrator at the front desk, um, I'm here, you know, give them your name, I'm here for my annual exam, but I do need an ac uh, accessible table or if you guys have the procedure room. Um, because a lot of, I mean, a lot of things get lost in translation so if you talk to one person, that person's really not going to tell the other person. So you really have to, again, at each step, provide the healthcare team your story. And then again, really discuss with your provider or the doctor about you. Like everything that you say back or everything that you tell the provider, you're going to get back from them. So don't be surprised if providers have assumptions about you or ask dumb questions, you know, because there's so many assumptions that people have had over the years and they've been carried over because again, there's not a disability course that these doctors take. So you are the expert on you. So be you, be open and honest as possible um, because you're gonna get it back from the doctor. Um, if you have to take someone with you um, because of again, accessibility issues, or if you're a healthcare provider, um, Oh, sorry, uh, if you're a caregiver or a loved one or a friend of somebody, um, it really is kind of a comfort, too, to take somebody with you if you need to get, you know, have them help you on the exam table. Um, and again, the more you say, the more you receive back. So be as open and honest. Um, I know some of these topics are embarrassing, but you want to have a complete and full sort of sexual reproductive um, life and take care of yourself. So the more you say, the more you receive. So what does the ideal um, OBGYN experience for us women with disabilities look like? So again, we go back to wheelchair Barbie. So it's all about self-awareness. How independent can we be? Um, we definitely have to advocate for you know, our own healthcare. No one's gonna do it for you. You have to empower yourself to be this um, and really kind of change the way that you know, a lot of healthcare professionals look at us women with disabilities. 
then um, can I actually get into the office? Is, is the office accessible? And is the door, is there a button for the door that opens for me? Um, is the bathroom accessible? Then we move to the elevated exam table. Um, can I actually transfer onto it? Or do I need help? Do I need a nurse to help me? Um, and the, the exam table, you know, it really does allow for comfortable position, not only for you, but also the provider. You know, you want to have a comprehensive uh, exam, so it really kind of helps both of you. The more you're comfortable, the better your exam is going to be. And then going back to sort of the OBGYN um, sort of uh, attitudinal barriers, you know, about knowledge on my condition sexual history. We don't want them to have assumptions. So please don't assume that I don't have sex or I, I want help with, you know, contraceptive use, um, pregnancy plans. I want to work with my provider. And again, the more open you can be, the better it's going to be for you. So these are sort of the ideal, this is the ideal experience that, you know, we're all trying to fight for and change because it really does matter. And we do matter. And um, I really want to, you know, emphasize that for sure. So there are resources available to you. Um, again, the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, I know that they actually just came out with a sexual and reproductive uh, booklet, which is really exciting. Um, ACOG website, they actually have this sort of tutorial video for physicians and providers to watch. Again, it's not required. Um, people can just watch it if they want to. Um, and then there's the Center for Research of Women with Disabilities in, at Baylor School of Medicine. So there's this thing called the Pelvic Health Initiative. So they have a bunch of videos, too, a bunch of research and articles. Um, so again, there are resources and information out there. It's really about engaging, you know, the healthcare profession to really sort of pay attention to us and have this sort of be um, something that matters to them. So there are resources out there. We just got to, you know, make sure that they pay attention to it. So here are my sort of final thoughts. Um, I love this quote by uh, Center for Research on Women with Disabilities. Where researchers fail to notice there are no answers, we will shout our questions louder. Where training has failed to teach the right solutions, we will teach each other. Where clinics have failed to let us in, we will speak truth to power. So again, we want to be part of the solution. So really encourage the removal of physical and attitudinal barriers for women with disabilities. Really talk to your providers, engage them into your life, your story, what your secondary conditions are, um, and encourage more education and dialogue among healthcare profession professionals and patients. So I kind of give like a sort of prescription to sort of everybody. We want more integration. We want better accessibility and really an improvement in quality of care because again, we do matter. So these are sort of my acknowledgments, um, kind of the research that I did to really sort of put this presentation together. Um, and again, I just wanna thank everybody for being on this call with me. I hope you got something out of it. Um, and I guess now, Mary, can we open it up for questions? Yes, if you wish or to ask comments? a question. If you wish to ask a question over the phone at this time, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please ensure the mute function on your telephone is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Again, it is star 1 if you wish to ask a question. We do have a question. Caller, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, hi, how are you? Um, I have actually a daughter who is four years old, um, paraplegic, and I am, I'm wondering, um, is now she's asking me questions about her, like her body, and I'm just wondering how exactly to, well, is there any other resources for teenage, well, not necessarily teenage, but younger children going into teenage, how to discuss their their sex ed with them as a paraplegic. So thank you for your question. Um, so you said she's four? Yeah, she's four now. And I'm, I'm actually, I haven't been able, she, I, I'm, she's not casting herself yet, but I, but I feel like she's getting to the stage where she's wanting to know what 
you know, what she's feeling um, with her hand because right. she can't feel it, you know, but what she's touching and, and trying to teach her how to cap herself. But um, I also just want to be prepared as she gets older. Um, so right. I like to do my own research, and I'm just in, like, a research stage. So more so for myself to just read up on, like, how to integrate this information to her as she grows. Yeah, I mean, um, sort of, uh, so she's kind of really curious about her body and what's happening to her right now. So um, I think you're doing an awesome job as kind of, I mean, my mom was really open with me, um, and my sex education actually happened in the hospital because I learned how to self-cast, um, and I had a mirror because I couldn't feel what was what, what I was touching. Um and so I had a mirror to help guide my catheter in, and I was like, oh, there's two holes down there, and, you okay, know, you're right, learning right. about your body. But um, I think, to you know, if you're, you're you are her mom, I mean, the more open you can be with her. I don't really know what books are, you know, are out there or anything, um, mm-hmm. but definitely, you know, as she grows older, um, she's going to have these questions. And, you know, I think, you know, kind of, the more we can create a disability community conversation um, yes. to talk to each other and share share advice, um, yes. you know, I think that would be awesome. But definitely, I mean, be open and honest with her. That's the best thing you can do. And um, don't shy away from any question that she has, you know. Great, um, great. But, and I also missed the beginning so of the oh, Go ahead. Sorry. I said you're a strong mom, so. Yeah, I'm hanging in there, but thank you. Um, I also missed the beginning of this call a little bit. I just wanted to know if you had anything personally that you've written or, or have that I could, um, like, follow up on, on everything that you're doing right now because you're honestly the first person that I've, I've, I know of that has had, like, this discussion, and you just gave me those three great resources. So um, I, really, I really have had a lot of questions about it, and I just don't know. You know, I, I'd like to, you know, get some more information from you as a woman talking about this. So do you have, yeah, like, no, for sure. Or? Yeah, um, so I, um, I did write about this whole, uh, you know, the sexual and reproductive health care for women with disabilities um, for U.S. News and World Report. And it is okay. uh, titled, Will to Barbie Goes to the Gynecologist? So I wrote an article, um, but I'm also on social media, so you can follow me on Facebook, um, Instagram, and I'm also a peer mentor for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. So if you want to have me as your mentor, you know, definitely sign up for that. And then, um, but I'm, you know, I'm here for you no matter what. And as she gets older, I know it's hard and complicated and it's frustrating. And, you know, a lot of these topics aren't, it, really talks it's about different, you know, but it's more I can, different than mine. Yeah. It's just different, but I feel like I the, the more I'm accepting of it, the more other people, you know, everyone around, I feel like should be accepting of it. It's just different, you know? Right. But the way it is. Yeah, and so. I, w- I mean, I would, say, I would say for her, since she's four, um, and as she gets older for, like, sleepovers, like, I remember my first sleepover with friends, because um, I was paralyzed at 12, so... I yeah. was having a really hard time casting in front of people, and I was really embarrassed because I had to wear pull-ups yeah. a lot. I still wear pull-ups. Um, right. I was glad I said, so. This is exactly what I, exactly stuff I would like to know. Perfect. So. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining in your questions. That's awesome. No, no problem. Thank you so much. For sure. We have no further questions over the phone at this time. We do have one question. Caller, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Claire Avenante. I'm actually uh, the Director of Women's Health Program for Women with Physical Disabilities um, and do a lot of exactly what you just said, have these conversations in hospitals and clinic settings allow, in, for providers um, for an awareness. Um, And I'm actually responding to the mom. I know my niece is also paraplegic and has been since a young age. 
And the, there were some American Girl doll books um, that were, I'm not, I, I can't guarantee that they were paraplegic specific, but I knew that there was a, a disabled American Girl um, and there are some books that go along. I don't know if it's still around, but they do have these books just for girls in general called The Care and Keeping of You that talk a lot about puberty and body changes. And regardless of disability or not, her body is going to go through changes, and that might help spark conversation. So that could be a good resource for you. Yeah, that's awesome. I would agree. And that, that was it. I just heard that. And being a mom and knowing those books and seeing them, I just wanted to, to jump in with that because I did not have them when I was that age. Um, but Cody, I really enjoyed your webinar. Um, I, it really resonated. And we're starting oh. at our health home, we're starting a peer mentorship program too. So it's exciting stuff. We're up in New York. Oh, oh very cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the more women with disabilities like talk about all these issues, the better we you know will be as a community and fighting Agreed. for what we deserve. So. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. There are no further questions over the phone at this time. So. Cody, we've reached um, 4 o'clock, or just about a minute past, and um, okay. I just want to say, you know, thank you again so very, very much for doing this webinar um, for our audience, um, for the Reed Foundation today. Um, if you have any last thoughts you want to share, and then we will uh, wrap things up. Um, I'm just really, you know, honored again to sort of, you know, um, do this presentation, and um, again, I kind of go around the country providing this presentation to OBGYN residents, so these are future doctors. Um, but, you know, I think the more we can all talk as a community of women with disabilities, um, uh, because a lot of these things are really sort of embarrassing or, you know, it's sensitive. So, um, but I'm just really happy that I was able to do this. And um, again, you can follow me on social media and see what I'm up to. But and I'm here for anybody, for any woman, um, and I can share personal details and stories with you. So um, again, I just want to help girls and women kind of really engage in, into life and get back out there. So again, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Cody, and thank you to everyone who uh, joined us today. Um, and this will bring our webinar um, to a close.